in an African-American museum to talk about African-American history, so much of which is truly unknown today. For example, if you know of James Armistead, a black patriot inspired during the American Revolution who helped make possible the 1781 Yorktown victory that established America as an independent nation. Or Peter Salem, a black patriot who was a hero of the 1775 Battle of Bunker Hill. He also fought as one of the legendary Minutemen and was a soldier at the battles of Saratoga and Stony Point. And in the famous picture of the 1776 crossing of the Delaware on Christmas night, two men depicted at the front of the boat include Prince Whipple and Oliver Cromwell, two black patriots who served with George Washington and the American generals during the Revolution. Few are aware that many of the soldiers who fought during the American Revolution were black. And unlike the later segregated regiments in the Civil War, many of the units in the American Revolution were fully integrated, with black patriots fighting and dying side by side with their white fellow comrades and soldiers. And equally unknown is much of what occurred in black political history. That history will surprise and perhaps even shock you. But as you will see, it's a history based on indisputable facts and documents. Too often today, only a handful of the heroes from black history are presented, much like showing only a snapshot or two out of several albums of photos. Too much is not seen, and often, too much is wrongly assumed just from the little that is seen. One of the world's oldest history books, the Bible, offers a good lesson on this point. We all know the Bible story of David's victory over Goliath, yet the Bible also tells the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and of his failure with his son Absalom. If all we learned about David were his failures, that would not be the complete story. On the other hand, if all we learned about David were his victories, neither would that be the complete story. It takes all of these accounts to present the full, accurate story. So from the Bible, and from former writers in black history, such as William Nell, Carter Woodson, Benjamin Quarles, Joseph Wilson, Booker T. Washington, Edward Johnson, and others, we learn that you must present the good, the bad, and the ugly to get the full story not only of history in general, but of African-American political history in particular. Although the history of black Americans begins in 1619 with the arrival of the first slaves in America, the political history of black Americans actually begins in the year 1787, the year in which the American political system was constructed. 1787 was the year the Constitution was written. Today, many critics assert that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document, and to prove this, they point to the three-fifths clause, claiming that the Constitution says that blacks are only three-fifths of a person. One of the earliest black Americans to investigate this claim was the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Douglass had been born into slavery and remained a slave until he escaped to New York. Three years after his escape, he delivered an anti-slavery speech in Massachusetts. He was promptly hired to work for the state's anti-slavery society, and he also served as a preacher at Zion Methodist Church. During Douglass's first years in freedom in the North, he studied at the feet of abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who taught him that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Douglass accepted this claim, and his early speeches and writings reflected that belief. However, Douglass later began to research the issue for himself. He read the Constitution. He read the writings of those who wrote the Constitution, and what he found revolutionized his thinking. He concluded that the Constitution was not a pro-slavery document, but rather it was an anti-slavery document. He explained, I was on the anti-slavery question, fully committed to the doctrine touching the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. I advocated this with pen and tongue, according to the best of my ability. However, Upon a latter reconsideration of the whole subject, I became convinced that the Constitution of the United States not only contained no guarantees in favor of slavery, but on the contrary, it is in its letter and spirit an anti-slavery instrument demanding the abolition of slavery as a condition of its own existence as the supreme law of the land. Now, here was a radical change in my opinions. But if the Constitution is not pro-slavery, then what about the three-fifths clause? Had Douglas not read that clause? Yes, he had. Then how could he conclude what he did about the Constitution? 
It was very simple. He understood that the three-fifths clause dealt only with representation and not the worth of any person. You see, the Constitution had established that for every 30,000 inhabitants in the state, that state would receive one representative to Congress. The southern states saw this as an opportunity to strengthen slavery. Slaves accounted for much of the southern population. In fact, almost half the inhabitants of South Carolina were slaves. Therefore, slave owners could simply count their slaves as regular inhabitants, and by so doing could almost double the number of their pro-slavery representatives to Congress. Of course, the anti-slavery leaders from the North strenuously objected to this. After all, slave owners did not consider their slaves to be persons, but only property. These slave owners were therefore using their property, that is, their slaves, to increase the power of the slave states in Congress. The anti-slavery leaders fully wanted free blacks counted, but not slaves, if counting slaves would increase the power of slave owners. They understood that the fewer the pro-slavery representatives to Congress, the sooner slavery could be eradicated from the nation. Several founders, including James Wilson and Elbridge Gerry, even used the slaveholders' own arguments against them. These anti-slavery founders argued that if the South was going to count its property, that is, its slaves, in order to get more pro-slavery representation in Congress, then the North would count its property, that is, its houses, cows, and horses, to get more anti-slavery representation in Congress. Of course, the South objected just as strongly to this proposal as the North had objected to counting slaves. The final compromise was that only 60% of slaves, that is, three-fifths of slaves, would be counted to calculate the number of Southern representatives to Congress. In other words, it would take 50,000 slaves rather than just 30,000 before slaveholding states could get a representative in Congress, thus greatly reducing the number of representatives to Congress from states with extraordinarily large slave populations. This, then, is the three-fifths clause. It had nothing to do with the worth of any individual. In fact, free blacks in the North and the South often were extended the full rights of a citizen and regularly voted, both in the North and the South. The three-fifths clause had to do only with representation. It was an anti-slavery provision designed to limit the number of pro-slavery representatives in Congress. This is why Frederick Douglass, unlike many today who have never taken time to study the Constitution, could emphatically declare that the Constitution, all of the Constitution, was anti-slavery. In 1789, following the ratification of the Constitution, Congress expanded its fight to end slavery by passing the Northwest Ordinance. That law forbade slavery in any of the federal territories then held. And for this reason, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin all eventually came into the nation as free states. On the federal level, progress was being made toward ending slavery and achieving full civil rights for black Americans. Another important point in black political history occurred three years later. In 1792, according to the website of the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Party was started by Thomas Jefferson. The Democratic Party definitely played a role in black political history, a role that will be examined shortly. Some years later, in 1808, Congress continued its fight against slavery by abolishing the slave trade. A famous sermon commemorating the abolition of the slave trade was given by the Reverend Absalom Jones, the first black bishop of the Episcopal Church in America. His sermon was delivered in the famous St. Thomas's Church. Very few today know that in 1808, Congress abolished the slave trade, or that Bishop Absalom Jones delivered such a compelling sermon. Although slavery still had not been abolished in all the states, things definitely were moving in the right direction. Yet a major reversal was about to occur. By 1820, most of the Founding Fathers were dead, and Thomas Jefferson's party, the Democratic Party, had become the majority party in Congress. With this new party in charge, a change in congressional policy emerged. Recall that the 1789 law prohibited slavery in a federal territory. In 1820, the Democratic Congress passed the Missouri Compromise and reversed that earlier policy, permitting slavery in almost half of the federal territories. Several states were subsequently admitted as slave states, and for the first time since the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution, slavery was being officially promoted by congressional policy. Several other pro-slavery laws were also passed by Democrats in Congress 
including the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. That law required Northerners to return escaped slaves back into slavery or else pay huge fines. In many instances, the law became little more than an excuse for Southern slave hunters to kidnap free blacks in the North and carry them into slavery in the South. For if a black was simply accused of being a slave, regardless of whether he actually was or not, under the Fugitive Slave Law, he was denied the benefit both of a jury trial and the right of habeas corpus, despite the fact that those rights had been explicitly guaranteed by the Constitution. Because the Fugitive Slave Law allowed free blacks to be carried into slavery, this law was disastrous for blacks in the North. And as a consequence of the atrocious provisions of this democratic law, some 20,000 blacks in the North completely left the United States and fled to Canada. In fact, the Underground Railroad reached the height of its activity during this period, helping thousands of slaves escape from slavery in the South all the way into Canada, simply to escape the reach of the Democrats' fugitive slave law. In 1854, the Democratic-controlled Congress passed another law strengthening slavery, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, thus allowing slavery to be introduced into parts of the new territory where it previously had been forbidden, thereby increasing the national area in which slavery would be permitted. In May of 1854, a number of the anti-slavery Democrats in Congress formed a new political party to fight slavery and secure equal rights for black Americans. The name of that party? They called it the Republican Party. They called it that because they wanted to return to the principles of freedom and equality first set forth in the governing documents of the Republic before the pro-slavery members of Congress had perverted those original principles. One of the founders of that new party was U.S. Senator Charles Sumner, who had taken the seat of the great anti-slavery senator, Daniel Webster. Sumner had a record of promoting civil rights. In fact, he had championed the desegregation of public schools in Boston. Here is his argument before the state Supreme Court on that issue. In 1856, Sumner gave a two-day long speech in the U.S. Senate against slavery. Following that speech, Democratic Representative Preston Brooks from South Carolina came from the House, across the rotunda of the Capitol, and over to the Senate where he literally clubbed down Sumner on the floor of the Senate, knocked him unconscious, and beat him almost to death. According to the sources of that day, many Democrats thought that Sumner's clubbing was deserved, and it even amused them. It was three and a half years before Sumner recovered himself sufficiently to return to the Senate. And not surprisingly, the first speech he delivered on his return to the Senate was again against slavery. In 1856, the Republican Party entered its first presidential election. In that election, the Republican Party issued this, its first party platform. It was a short document. There were only nine planks in the platform, but significantly, six of the nine planks set forth bold declarations of equality and civil rights for African Americans based on the principles of the Declaration of Independence. The Democratic platform of that year took an opposite position, strongly defending slavery. In fact, it warned, all efforts of the abolitionists are calculated to lead to the most alarming and dangerous consequences. And all such efforts have an inevitable tendency to diminish the happiness of the people. Amazingly, according to Democrats in 1856, attempting to end slavery would ruin the happiness of the people. Despite such clear differences, the Republicans lost that election. The next year, 1857, a Democrat-controlled Supreme Court delivered this, the Dred Scott decision, declaring blacks were not persons or citizens, but instead were property and therefore had no rights. In fact, quoting from this infamous decision, Democrats on the court announced that blacks had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. In the 1860 presidential election, Republican Abraham Lincoln ran against Democrat U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Both parties again issued platforms. The Republican platform of 1860 blasted both the Fugitive Slave Law and the Dred Scott decision, and it announced its continued intent to end slavery and secure equal civil rights for black Americans. On the other hand, the Democrats and their 1860 platform praised both the Fugitive Slave Law and the Dred Scott decision. In fact, 
Democrats even handed out copies of the Dred Scott decision along with their platform to affirm their belief that it was proper to have slavery and to hold African Americans in bondage. It is worth noting that for over a century and a half, Democrats often have taken a position that some human life is disposable, as they did in the Dred Scott decision. In that instance, a black individual was not a life, it was property. And you could do with your property as you wished. Today, Democrats have largely taken that same position on unborn human life, that an unborn human is really just disposable property to do with as one wishes. African Americans were the victims of this disposable property ideology a century and a half ago, and still are today. Consider. Although only 12% of the current population is African American, almost 35% of all abortions are performed on African Americans. In fact, over the last decade, for every 100 African American live births, there were 53 abortions of African American babies. Democrats have encouraged this. In fact, congressional Democrats are almost rapidly pro-abortion, and they consistently vote against protections for innocent, unborn human life. For over a century and a half, Democrats have wrongly argued that some human life is merely disposable personal property, and black Americans have suffered most under this philosophy. In the 1860 presidential election, Republican Abraham Lincoln was elected with only 40% of the popular vote, but 59% of the Electoral College vote. Republicans also won a majority in the U.S. House and Senate in that election, thus giving Republicans control of the lawmaking process for the very first time. Given the bold anti-slavery and pro-civil rights positions set forth by Republicans in their platforms, it was obvious to Democrats what was about to occur. The anti-slavery and pro-civil rights position of the Republicans were about to become reality. What was the Democratic response? Southern Democrats left Congress and took their states with them, forming a nation that described itself as the slave-holding Confederate States of America. While Northern Democrats did not support secession, they nonetheless generally supported slavery and imposed civil rights for black Americans. In short, the main difference between Southern and Northern Democrats at that time was their view on secession, not slavery. Who were the leaders of that new nation of slave-holding states? Democratic U.S. Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi became the president of this new slave-holding nation, and Democratic Representative Alexander Stevens of Georgia became its vice president. However, returning to the election of 1860, with Republicans firmly in control of the federal government, they quickly began implementing significant changes. In 1862, Republicans abolished slavery in Washington, D.C., and in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, freeing all slaves in the southern states in rebellion. In 1864, following the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, several civil rights laws and laws preparing to facilitate civil rights were passed. One of them was this bill establishing the Freedmen's Bureau. Another was this bill equalizing pay for soldiers in the military, whether white or black. The Fugitive Slave Law was also repealed that year over the almost unanimous opposition of the Northern Democrats still in Congress. While Republicans in the North were working to end slavery and secure civil rights, the new nation of Southern Democrats was determined to head in an opposite direction. In fact, Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens, the Democrat from Georgia, delivered a speech entitled, African Slavery, the Cornerstone of the Southern Confederacy. In that speech, Stevens first correctly acknowledged that the Founding Fathers, even those from the South, had never intended for slavery to remain in America. Southern Democrats had been willing to form an entire nation on the foundation of white supremacy. After the war, General Nathan Bedford Forrest became the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was an honored leader at the Democratic National Convention of 1868. Given the composition of the Democratic Party, it is no wonder that not one of the Democrats in Congress voted for the 14th Amendment to secure civil rights to black Americans at the state level. In 1868 in Mississippi, Democrats and the Klan attacked blacks on their way to vote for the new Constitution. In Mississippi at that time, there were 444,000 blacks and only 383,000 whites. Since blacks voted overwhelmingly Republican, only by preventing blacks from voting could Democrats defeat the new state constitution with the civil rights provisions, hence the cause of the violence. Notwithstanding the strident opposition throughout the southern states, the new constitutions were eventually passed 
and a number of black Americans were elected to national office under those new constitutions. This 1872 print by Courier and Ives shows the first seven black Americans elected to the U.S. Congress. Significantly, all seven were Republicans. On the left side of the picture is Hiram Rhodes Revels from Mississippi, an ordained minister. He served as a missionary and pastor, recruited three black regiments, and was a chaplain during the Civil War. Revels became America's first black U.S. Senator. Next is Benjamin Turner of Alabama. Turner was a slave during the Civil War, but within five years after the war, he had become a wealthy and prosperous businessman. Next is Robert DeLarge of South Carolina. Born as a slave, within three years of the end of the war, he was serving in the State House. He also chaired the Republican Party's platform committee and became a statewide elected official. Next is Josiah Walls of Florida. Walls was a slave during the Civil War and was forced to fight for the Confederate Army. After he was captured by Union troops, however, he promptly enlisted as a Union soldier and even became an officer. After his election to Congress, his credentials were challenged by Democrats and he was twice sent home. He was re-elected after the first challenge, but during the second challenge, Democrats regained control of Florida and he was prevented from returning. Next is Jefferson Long of Georgia. Born as a slave, he was self-educated and built a thriving business. However, when elected to Congress as a Republican, Democrats boycotted his business, causing him great financial losses. Long was the first black American to deliver a congressional speech in the U.S. House. Next is Joseph Hayne Rainey of South Carolina. Born a slave, he actually served briefly as Speaker of the U.S. House and was in Congress longer than any other black American from that era. The seventh is Robert Brown Elliott, also of South Carolina. He was well educated, reading in Spanish, French, and Latin. In Congress, he led in the passage of civil rights bills over the strident opposition of congressional Democrats, and he later became Speaker of the House in the state legislature. Revels took the seat once held by Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis, who left the Senate in 1861 and became the president of the slave-holding Confederate States of America. The editorial cartoons of the day did not fail to note the irony that a black Republican senator had taken the same seat once held by racist Democrat Jefferson Davis. Notice all the Republicans gathered around Senator Revels. Who is that skulking in the foreground? Democrat Jefferson Davis, filled with rage and hatred as a black Republican takes his seat. While the Reverend Hiram Rhodes Revels was the first black American to serve in the U.S. Senate, there have been others as well. The second was Blanche Kelso Bruce, the first to serve a full term in the Senate. The third black senator was Edward Brooke. Significantly, the first three black U.S. senators, Revels, Bruce, and Brooke, were all Republicans. Carol Mosley Braun of Illinois was the fourth black American to serve in the U.S. Senate, but only the first Democrat. And Barack Obama, also from Illinois, was only the second black Democratic U.S. Senator. The first African American elected to the U.S. House was Joseph Hayne Rainey of South Carolina. He was the first of 23 black Americans elected to the U.S. Congress, all as Republicans. Remarkably, of those early black congressmen, 13 had been slaves. Consider the amazing transformation that this represents. In only five years, black Americans had gone from being slaves to becoming members of Congress. Not only had 13 of the early black congressmen been slaves, but many were home or self-educated. Additionally, three of that group were ministers, seven were attorneys, five were school teachers, four were university presidents, and 13 were state legislators, a distinguished group with momentous achievements. Democrats did not elect their first black American to the U.S. House until 1935, and that black member was from Illinois, a northern state in which blacks had always been free. It was not until 1973 that the first black American Democrats were elected to Congress from the South, Barbara Jordan of Texas and Andrew Young of Georgia. And they were elected only after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the gerrymandered district lines that Southern Democratic state legislatures had drawn that kept blacks from being elected. <laughs>
1956, Democratic Governor Alan Shivers of Texas deployed the Texas Rangers to keep blacks from entering schools in Mansfield. The following year, 1957, Democratic Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas called out the National Guard to keep black students from entering Central High School in Little Rock. Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower quickly intervened and he federalized the Arkansas National Guard to take it away from Governor Faubus. Eisenhower then replaced the Arkansas Guard with 1,200 troops from the elite 101st Airborne Division, ordering them to protect the nine black students who had chosen to go to Central High. Democrats in the U.S. Senate strongly protested against Eisenhower's actions to protect these black students. Georgia Democratic Governor Marvin Griffin also attacked Eisenhower's actions and promised that as long as he held office, he would, quote, maintain segregation in the schools and the races will not be mixed come hell or high water, end quote. To prepare for the possibility that Eisenhower might do in Georgia what he had done in Arkansas, Legislation was introduced in the democratically controlled Georgia legislature so that if desegregation was attempted, the public schools of the state would be dissolved and replaced with state-run private schools so that blacks could be excluded. These types of schools became known as segregation academies. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, Democratic Governor Faubus unable to prevent black students from attending school because of the federal protection they had received, simply shut down the schools for the next year to prevent further attendance. And Virginia Democratic Governor James Almond, like other Southern Democratic governors, also shut down public schools rather than permit black students to attend. In 1960 in Louisiana, where Democratic Governor Jimmy Davis supported segregation, it required four federal marshals to accompany little Ruby Bridges so she could attend a public elementary school in New Orleans. When Ruby entered that school, Every other parent in that school pulled their children out of the school, and for the entire year, little Ruby was the only student in that school building, just Ruby and her school teacher from Boston. So deep-seated was the racism among Southern Democratic leaders that when the 1964 Civil Rights Bill became law, Lester Maddox, who became Democratic governor of Georgia, sold the fast food business that he owned rather than serve blacks in his restaurant. And in 1960, Mississippi Democratic Governor Hugh White even requested that evangelist Billy Graham segregate his crusades, something Graham refused to do. In fact, when South Carolina Democratic Governor George Timmerman learned that Billy Graham had invited African Americans to a Reformation rally at the South Carolina State Capitol, he promptly denied use of the facilities to the evangelist. This type of democratic response against black Americans and the whites who supported them was common across much of the South. And the reasons given by democratic leaders to justify this disgusting behavior was simply states' rights. The same rhetoric they had used a century earlier, first to justify slavery and the creation of a slaveholding nation, and then to enact laws enforcing segregation and withholding voting rights from black Americans for the next 80 years after the Civil War. In that 1932 presidential election, incumbent Republican President Herbert Hoover received more than three-fourths of the black vote over Democratic challenger Franklin D. Roosevelt. Despite the strong and united opposition of black Americans, Roosevelt narrowly won that election, and he did genuinely begin to try to make some changes in the direction of his Democratic Party. And it was under Roosevelt that Democrats, for the very first time, placed language in their platform calling for an end to racial discrimination. Yet despite the new language in their platform, Democrats in Congress still killed every piece of civil rights legislation introduced in that era. A Democratic leader much more courageous than Franklin Roosevelt was President Harry S. Truman, perhaps the first national Democratic leader vigorously to advocate for strong civil rights protections. Despite his noble goals, Truman, like FDR before him, learned that it was difficult for rank-and-file Democrats to reshape their long-held views on race. Despite the existence of the Klan and other racist groups within the Democratic Party, Truman worked boldly and openly to change his party. In 1946, he became the first modern president to institute a comprehensive review of race relations, and he introduced an aggressive 10-point civil rights legislative package that included an anti-lynching law, a ban on the poll tax, and desegregation of the military. But Democrats, again, killed all of his proposals, including his proposed civil rights commission.
The president following Democrat Harry Truman was World War II hero, Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower, elected in 1952. Eisenhower was well aware of the Southern Democratic congressional commitment to racial segregation. Understanding that it would be difficult to make substantial changes in law and that the progress would be slow at best, Eisenhower determined to eliminate racial discrimination in all areas under his authority. He therefore issued executive orders halting segregation in the District of Columbia, the military, and federal agencies. Furthermore, he was the first president to appoint a black American, Frederick Morrill, to an executive position on the White House staff. And although he also proposed a vigorous civil rights legislative protection plan for blacks in the Southern Democratic states, Democrats in Congress were able to prevent any legislative progress. Given his pro-civil rights record, it is not surprising that in his 1956 re-election, Eisenhower, like Republican presidents before him, received significant support from black voters. After his re-election, Eisenhower continued his civil rights efforts. In 1957, he proposed a bold civil rights bill to increase black voting rights and protections, proposals promptly blocked by Democratic Senator James Eastland of Mississippi, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. In fact, Eastland is credited with killing every civil rights bill that came before his committee in the 1950s, and his committee was literally known as the burial ground for civil rights legislation in the U.S. Senate. The stiff Democratic opposition in the Senate resulted in a very watered-down version of Eisenhower's original bill. Yet despite the fact that the bill was much weaker than introduced, Eisenhower did succeed in creating a civil rights division within the U.S. Justice Department, as had earlier been proposed by his predecessor, President Truman. This division subsequently played a prominent role in helping secure civil rights in the South during the 1960s and 1970s. That law also started a civil rights commission that became instrumental in publicizing the effects of Southern segregation and racial oppression. In 1959, Eisenhower presented a second civil rights bill to Congress. That bill was met with unyielding opposition in the House by Democratic Representative Howard Smith of Virginia, chairman of the House Rules Committee. In fact, Smith would actually disappear from Congress for weeks on end simply to keep his committee from acting on the civil rights bill. Democratic House member Emanuel Seller of New York, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, exerted extraordinary effort to move the bill forward even though he was strongly opposed by other members within his own party. When the bill finally passed the House and arrived in the Senate, it was gutted by Democrats before being passed into law, once again preventing the federal government from intervening on behalf of black Americans whose civil rights were being violated in the South. Democrat John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. Following the violent racial discord in Birmingham in 1963, Kennedy did send a major civil rights bill to Congress, a bill based on the findings of Eisenhower's 1957 Civil Rights Commission. Kennedy worked aggressively for the passage of that civil rights bill, but was tragically assassinated before he could see its success. Democratic successor Lyndon Johnson picked up the civil rights measure, but like his predecessors, he faced stiff opposition from his own party. In fact, Democratic Senators Robert Byrd of West Virginia and Richard Russell of Georgia led the opposition against the 1964 Civil Rights Act, including lengthy and extended filibuster speeches. Republican Senator Everett Dirksen resurrected language proposed by Eisenhower's Attorney General in 1960, thus breaking the filibuster of the Civil Rights Bill and allowing Johnson to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964, followed by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Perhaps the most recognizable civil rights leader of that era was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Like Frederick Douglass, the great civil rights leader of the previous century, Dr. King was also a Christian minister of the gospel. He was with President Johnson when the famous civil rights bill was signed into law. These two important civil rights acts were signed into law under a Democratic president, but it was the Republicans in Congress who made possible the passage of both acts, for Johnson had been unable to garner sufficient Democratic support to pass either bill. At that time, Democrats had 315 members in Congress, almost two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate. President Johnson needed only a simple majority, only 269 votes to get those bills passed. 
But out of the 315 Democrats, only 198 voted for the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts. Democrats had it completely within their power to pass those bills, but they did not. Republicans overwhelmingly came to the aid of Democrat President Johnson. If not for the strong support of Republicans, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 would never have become law. Not to mention the fact that the heart of both bills came from the work of Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Other significant progress in civil rights had also been made in 1964. For in addition to the Civil Rights Act, it was that same year that the passage of the 24th Amendment to the Constitution abolishing the poll tax had occurred. Significantly, a repeal of the poll tax had been proposed on at least 14 previous occasions. And on five of those occasions, the House had actually passed a ban. But each time, the Senate Democrats had kept the poll tax alive. It was nearly 85 years after the first poll tax was instituted by Democrats before the ban on the poll tax was finally approved by the Senate. And of the 16 senators who wanted to keep the poll tax alive, 15 of them were Democrats. The positive impact of these changes was both obvious and immediate. Within a year, 450,000 new Southern blacks were successfully registered to vote. In Mississippi, voter registration of black Americans rose from only 5% in 1960 to 60% by 1968. And the number of blacks serving in federal and state legislatures rose from only two in 1965 to 160 by 1990. African Americans made their earliest and some of their most significant political and civil rights gains while affiliated with the Republican Party. And that progress is still continuing in this generation. Consider the Texas election in which African-American Ron Kirk, former mayor of Dallas, was running for a U.S. Senate seat. When Kirk lost that election, voices across the nation asserted that the South was still too racist to elect a minority on a statewide ballot. What they failed to mention was that in that same election, three African-Americans were elected to statewide office on the very same statewide ballot as Kirk. But those three were elected as Republicans rather than Democrats. Apparently, Texas became the first state in American history to elect three black Americans to statewide office. But since they were all Republicans, that story simply was not reported. And in that same election cycle, black Americans were elected to statewide office in other states as well, including a black lieutenant governor in Ohio and another in Maryland, both as Republicans. An important point is illustrated by these recent elections and by scores before them. In democratically controlled states, rarely are African Americans elected statewide, with the exception of U.S. Senators in Illinois and a governor in Virginia. And most African American Democratic members of Congress usually are elected only from minority districts. That is, Democratic districts where minority voters make the majority, rather than where there's a Democratic majority of white voters. On the other hand, African American Republicans are usually elected statewide in Republican states or in congressional districts with large white majorities, such as when J.C. Watts was elected to Congress as a Republican in a district with only 9% African American voters. Perhaps this explains why Frederick Douglass, a century ago, reminded black Americans. For colored voters, the Republican Party is the ship, all else is the sea. The political history of African Americans has often proved Douglas right. Yet no one from any background, whether a political, religious, or racial background, should ever love any political party above principle. Although history is clear that there have been major differences in how political parties treated black Americans, neither party is completely blameless in all of its actions, nor have all the leaders in a party always been good or always been bad. one great political idea. The idea is an old one. It's widely and generally assented to. Nevertheless, it's very generally trampled upon and disregarded. The best expression of it I found in the Bible. It is in substance, righteousness exalted a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14 and 34.
Now this constitutes my politics, the negative and positive of my politics, and the whole of my politics. I feel it my duty to do all in my power to infuse this idea into the public mind that it may be practiced. Douglas was right. As citizens, we must vote righteously. And by the way, this first assumes that we are voting. This responsibility to vote and to vote righteously has been made clear from generation to generation. One such voice heralding this responsibility was that of Charles Finney. Finney was a famous American revivalist, a leader in the American revival movement called the Second Great Awakening. He was also the president of a college that even decades before the Civil War admitted both black and white students as equals. In fact, the students from the college where Reverend Finney was president not only became some of the most active conductors of the Underground Railroad, but also started several of America's black colleges and universities. Reverend Finney wisely admonished, the time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this manner, but the time has come when they must act differently. Amen. Christians seem to act as if they think God does not see what they do in politics, but I tell you, He does see it, and He will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. So when voting, no vote should be cast solely on the basis of any party. The values of each individual candidate must be examined using the standard of biblical righteousness cited by Frederick Douglass, the principles of Christianity as cited by Robert Brown Elliott, and an awareness that voters will answer to God for their vote as pointed out by the Reverend Charles Finney. An illustration of this important principle seen in the life of Dr. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration who worked with the Reverend Richard Allen to found the AME Church. Dr. Rush served in the presidential administrations of three different presidents, each of whom was from a different political party. How could he do this? What was his own party affiliation? He once explained. I have been alternately called an aristocrat and a democrat. I am neither. I am a Christocrat. Benjamin Rush didn't care what a party called itself. When he found someone who stood for God's principles, he would stand with him, no matter the party. The love of correct principles and not the love of a party must be the key to our political involvement. What legacy of faith and politics will we leave for the next generation? Obviously, the choice is ours. But having this choice, we should heed the warning delivered to citizens in 1803 by the Reverend Matthias Burnett. Consider well the important trust which God has put in your hands. To God and posterity, you are accountable for your rights and your rulers. Let not your children have reason to curse you for giving up those rights and prostrating those institutions which your fathers have delivered to you. Leaders for generations have wisely recognized that the quality of our government depends more upon the quality and character of our leaders than upon any other factor. And they also understood that we were responsible for choosing leaders of character and righteousness, just as Frederick Douglass reminded voters of this truth based on Proverbs 1434, so too did the Reverend Francis Grimke. Francis Grimke was born to a slave mother in 1850 in South Carolina and served as a valet in the Confederate Army until emancipation. After the war, he attended Lincoln University, Howard University, and Princeton Theological Seminary, then became minister of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., the same church earlier pastored by the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett. Grimke was also one of the forces behind the formation of the NAACP and in a sermon delivered on Sunday, March the 7th, 1909, Reverend Grimke admonished his hearers on their civic responsibilities based on God's righteousness. If the time ever comes when we shall go to pieces, it will be from inward corruption. Amen. Amen. From the disregard of right principles, from losing sight of the fact that righteousness, righteousness exalted the nation, yes. but that sin is a reproach to any people. Amen. 
the secession of the southern states in 1860 was a small matter with the secession of the Union itself from the great principles enunciated in the Declaration of Independence, yes. 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 in the Golden Rule, yes. in the Ten Commandments, yes. Yes. Come on, in the Sermon on the Mount. That's yes. it. That's yes. it. That's Unless we hold Come. and hold firmly yes. Yes. to these great fundamental principles right. of righteousness, yes. Yes. our union will only be a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. If it continues to exist, it will be a curse and not a blessing. My Lord.